We are in Leviticus 23. And Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch made an interesting remark in his writings. He says, the Jews' catechism is his calendar. And we're going to explore the Hebrew calendar tonight. You may recall that Paul in Galatians 3.25 pointed out that the law is our schoolmaster. And we often understand that in denotative terms, of course, as we study Romans and Galatians and so on. But the term really is far broader than most of us may realize. Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus said that I come not to destroy the Torah of the prophets, I come not to destroy but to fulfill. And one of the premises of our ministry is to emphasize that every detail in the Scripture points is, is there by design, first point. Secondly, it generally is linkable directly to Jesus Christ. And we'll see that very evident in the strange details of what constitutes the um, Hebrew calendar as specified in the Torah. Now, there are things in the Hebrew calendar that come from other traditions. Purim comes from the story, you know, the story of Esther, and, and Hanukkah comes from the, the rededication of the temple after uh, being desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes and so forth. So there are things in the Jewish calendar that are, that are also relevant, but we're going to focus here on the Torah, the seven feasts of Moses, if you will. Now, the Jewish calendar turns out to be an ultimate teaching aid. Romans 15.4 reminds us that he, where Paul says, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That's quite a verse. That challenges us to recognize in every detail of these quaint, weird ordinances and laws and what have you and the, we encounter through the Scripture, they're not there by accident. If, we, if we're diligent and peel back the details and get into it, we'll discover that there's a treasure and that treasure almost always points directly to Jesus Christ. Now we can talk a little bit about calendars. I'll spare you a, a long treatise on that, but it's interesting that there are at least 14 of the ancient calendars, probably all of them, that were built on a 360-day year. And it's interesting that all of them, the Mayan, the uh, you, you can go through... 14 of them, and we have a briefing pack on that called Signs in the Heavens that goes into that, but they all changed about 701 B.C. for some reason. And there's some interesting conjectures about that, and we explore those conjectures about a possible Mars flyby and so forth that are really very provocative and surprisingly supported, although certainly not conclusively, um, but you can look in our briefing package, Signs in the Heavens, to get that background. But the point is, most of the calendars changed. Pope Gregory the uh, 13th, in 1582, added um, five and a quarter days to get the calendar. See, one of the problems is, is that the lunar calendar and the solar calendar and the sidereal calendar measures around the sun from the stars. Solar around the sun itself and the lunar calendar is geared to the mo movements of the moon. And none of them quite reconcile as simply as you'd think. And so that's where some of the problems occur. But in any case, much of this is recognized in the 16th century and Pope Gregory the 13th solved the problem for his part of the world by adding five and a quarter days, and that the Gregorian calendar replaced the Julian calendar gradually in, over the various countries, and that's basically what we're heir to. The lunar calendar, you see, is about 11 and a half days shorter than the solar year. What's strange is this occurred in the reign of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah solved the problem of getting it readjusted, not with a leap year thing we're used to, but with a leap month. And he added what they call an intercalary month, uh, was added uh, for seven leap years in a 19-year cycle. So during that 19-year cycle, they add a month in the third, sixth, eighth, eleventh, fourteenth, seventeenth, and nineteenth years. You say, well, that's kind of weird. Yes, it is. <laughs> And uh, there's a, a lot of aspects. Anyone that thinks the calendar studies is simple really needs to get very careful, be very precise, and make sure you're dealing with very authoritative documents. But it's uh, in any case, this idea, you'll discover that if, in the Jewish calendar, every once in a while, they'll add a month. Adar, they have a month of Adar. They add, they add what they call Adar two, a second month. And uh, they do that, as I say, seven times in a 19-year cycle. Another thing we should be sensitive to as we get into this, realize that the Jewish calendar day starts at sundown, nominally. We're used to a Gentile concept of midnight to midnight. But the Jewish calendar, it's evening and morning were the first day in Genesis. Correction, it was day one. 
The first day was an ordinal, not a relative number, but that's another issue. Um, anyway, let's jump into Leviticus 23, where we're going to discuss the Feasts of Moses. In Leviticus 23, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. This is God speaking. Now the details of the feasts we're going to talk about are actually largely given elsewhere. But here they're at least set out in order altogether. And you'll find the feasts are in, there are three feasts in the first month of the year, of the religious year. There are three feasts in the seventh month of the year. And there's one kind of weird in between. The spring feasts are the first three. We'll get into this, but when you get to the, 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 the Jewish civil calendar, I'll call it the Genesis calendar, starts in the fall. Rosh Hashanah is their new year. It's in, on our calendar, it's usually around September. But when they were in Egypt, and Moses was called to lead them out of Egypt, and the Passover was instituted, in Exodus 12, verse 1, God, in addition to giving him all the details about the Passover, putting the blood on the doorposts and so forth, he says, this month, that's the month of Nisan, will be the beginning of months. So God revises their calendar in Exodus 12, 1. So the religious calendar starts in the spring. Nisan was in the spring. Passover's in the spring. And so in that month of Nisan, we have three of the feasts. Passover on the 14th. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a sequence that starts on the 15th, the day after. And then there's this strange feast, the Feast of First Fruits, which occurs the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Since Passover can be any, any day of the week, depending on what year you're in, it, it's nailed to the calendar, because it's the 14th. But following whenever it is, there's a Shabbat, a Saturday. The next morning is the Feast of First Fruits, which is always thus on a Sunday. You with me? Okay. There are three feasts in the fall. The Feast of Trumpets. Now, the Feast of Trumpets occurs on the first of Tishri. That's the seventh month of the year. It's also the day they celebrate as Rosh Hashanah, and most people, even Jews, assume they're the same thing. No, Rosh Hashanah is a civil celebration starting the civil new year. It's called, that's what, it's the head of the year is what Rosh Hashanah means. It's, the, it's, their, it's their new year. It also happens to be the day Religiously, it's the seventh month, and they, they celebrate the Feast of Trumpets. Okay? And we'll talk about each one of these a little bit. The, so the, both those occur on the same day, but they're really from a, uh, from a different point of view. But ten days later is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most solemn of all the feasts. Five days later is the Feast of Tabernacles. So those three feasts are in the seventh month. And uh, we're going to discover that these feasts are not only commemorative, they all have a historical roots, but they're also prophetic. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the first three feasts seem to point to the first, were, were fulfilled prophetically in the first coming of Christ. The last three feasts, prophetically, are fulfilling the second coming of Christ. Fifty days after the Feast of First Fruits, there's a strange one in between. It's after the spring, but it's not fall yet. And that's the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And that's a strange one. And most scholars, unless you've really studied it, have only scratched the surface on that peculiar feast. It may have far more significance to any of us than we probably have the imagination to realize. So those are the seven feasts we're going to talk about in this review. Let's go on to verse 3. God sort of sets aside another issue. He doesn't focus on it, but he, he documents it here. He says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So this is the seventh day issue. Shabbat is the seventh day. Now it's interesting that this sevenfold structure pervades the whole Bible. We could spend many evenings just exploring not just the overt sevens that we're all conscious of just by reading the Bible, the seven of this and seven of that. There's hundreds of those. There are sevens that are hidden in the structure. If you outline a passage, you'll always discover there's seven parts very often. We're also discovering that hidden underneath the text there are some sevens, by the way. So they talk. Ivan Pannon made his whole 50-year career just making discoveries about this, what, the, what we call the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure of the Scripture. But this sevenfold structure is evident right here in the calendar, too. We have seven days that make a week. Everybody knows that. We have seven weeks that make up to the Feast of Weeks. It's, there is a sabbatical week, in a sense. Um, there are seven months to the year, from Nizon to Tishri. 
And there's also seven years to, to the sabbatical year. So you have seven of days, a seven of weeks, a seven of months, and a seven of years in God's structure. And uh, this is not the impression of some commentator. This is uh, ordained by God himself, quite clearly. We'll talk about the sabbatical year and the strange year called the year of Jubilee when we get to uh, chapter uh, 25 in Leviticus. But I want to point out, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the Sabbath day, except to point out it is pre-Mosaic. It did not yet originate in the Ten Commandments. It didn't originate in Moses. He was just reminded to, to observe it. It was ordained back in Eden. And now some people overreact to that, and they make a whole thing of you know, Saturday worship, putting themselves, trying to, in effect, putting themselves back under the law. On the one hand, we don't do that in the Christian church. We, we've chosen to celebrate Sunday, to celebrate His resurrection, and that's fine. But let's realize that nowhere in the Scripture is the worship of Sabbath set aside. Jesus just simply made himself the Lord of the Sabbath, and he clearly is. So there's a big, anyone that thinks that's a simple issue hasn't studied it. So we invite you to look at our briefing pack called the Seventh Day, which gets into that, and it certainly generates some discussion. So, But that's not our focus here. It's mentioned in passing. We're going to verse 4. It says, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Let's understand as we study this calendar that this is a calendar that God established. It's not the contrivance of some civil authority or it's not just simply a Jewish tradition or what have you. God set it up. What's translated here, holy convocation, is actually the word mikrah in the Hebrew. It means rehearsal. Really? See, that's kind of interesting because we're going to discover it has a prophetic role too. Where it says they proclaim in their seasons. The word seasons is mawad, which means to keep an appointment. So in the very linguistic structure here is the hint that these things are not just commemorating something of the past. They certainly do. They're also a hint of that which is coming. And that's where this starts to get very, very provocative. Now we're looking at Leviticus 23. If you're going to get into this more thoroughly, you might put in your notes, you want to put Numbers 28 and 29 as two chapters that give you a lot of detail behind these. And also Deuteronomy 16. Numbers 28 and 29 and Deuteronomy 16, as well as Leviticus 23. There are also some very provocative discoveries that the computers have determined about this text. I'll leave that to the end so we don't derail our time here. But Paul tells us that these feasts are not only commemorative, they're prophetic. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. The first point, the real point he's making there, no one should judge you about keeping the Sabbath or any of these things. That's part of the past, Paul is pointing out. We're, we're new creatures in Christ. We worship the Lord of those things. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So he, make, he makes that point. Let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holy day. Boy, that's a relief, isn't it? There's plenty of people around that will point fingers no matter what you do. Or of the new moon. That was a big thing in the Jewish economy, the new moon. And that's a whole other study. But, or of the Sabbath days. But he, he says something else, which are a shadow of things to come. So this idea that they're prophetic, not just historical, is not some contrivance. It's, it's in the Scripture. And by the way, the hermeneutics, or the, you know, that is the, the teachings of interpretation, by the Midrash points out that prophecy is pattern, not just prediction. This idea of prediction and fulfillment, prediction and fulfillment, and that's a model of the Western mind. The Jewish mind recognized that, the, that prophecy is also pattern. We see what God is going to do by seeing He, he works in patterns. And, you can, and there's a wonderful, wonderful family of studies in that area. We call them macro codes. For you, it'd be the computer jargonese. Um, a macro code is a code that's sort of anticipating what's coming. What you're doing is an email or a letter. It's a macro. You, you often use a macro to do that. Um, the Bible's full of those. The Abram's offering of Isaac was prophetic. He knew it was. The 2,000 years later, on that very spot, another father would be offering his son and so on. They're fascinating, uh, uh, these to study, but I don't want to get lose our timing here. Let's keep moving. But these are all evidences that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The Old Testament closes with uh, unfulfilled promises, unappeased yearnings. All those are fulfilled in the, Old, in the New Testament. If you take the Old Testament by itself, it's incomplete. It's demonstrably 
yearning for some conclusions. Those conclusions are all manifest in the New Testament. The first one that we're going to take of these series is the Passover, verse, starting at verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Now he's, he's calling Nisan the first month. I'll take up a little later in the hour to explain how that calendar changed, but for this purpose, the religious purposes, Nisan in the spring is considered the first month of the religious year. It happens to be the seventh month of the civil year, but that's neither here nor there. Let's keep moving here. Now, in a commemorative sense, obviously very clear that the Passover commemorates their deliverance from Egypt in Exodus 12 and so on. It's interesting that God, see, the, the significance of the Exodus of Egypt, that's where the nation was considered to be born. When did Israel, they went down as a family under, under Joseph and all that, but they came out as a nation. And God, all through the scripture, it speaks of Israel being born in the Exodus. It's the birth of a nation. In fact, in Exodus 4, God speaks of them as my firstborn. Well, that's pretty interesting because Jesus is also reckoned as God's firstborn. In Zechariah 12, 10, they shall look upon me whom they pierced and mourn for him as only son and so on. So there's an idiomatic sense that there's a parallel between the nation and Jesus, and that's, that parallel is observable all through the Scripture. That's how Matthew, when he talks about Joseph and Mary taking the baby uh, after Herod died, they, they could come back. They went there in refuge to get away from Herod. When he died, they could come back. And when Matthew talks about that in Matthew chapter 2, he says, Out of Egypt I've called my son. Well, when you read Hosea 12, 1, where that appears, no way does that, is that messianic. It's talking about the nation Israel. But see, Matthew's arguing in a, in a midrashic sense that idiomatically it's Christ is a parallelism to Israel. That's what he's making. See, again, prophecy's pattern, not just prediction. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that God predicted their deliverance 430 years earlier to the very day. But again, that's another whole study. That's in Genesis 15, 13 through 16. Getting back to the observance of Passover, the way they observed Passover... After that, I mean, as they observe Passover, the lambs for Passover are inspected on the 10th, four days in advance, on the 10th of Nisan. And then they're slain on the 14th, on Passover, between the evenings. And it's interesting, by the way, the way they originally did it was that lamb had to be in your family, in the house. Well, in four days, the kids get attached to it. Then you're going to kill it for Passover? That's a shocker. It's intended to be. God's trying to instruct that sin has a penalty. Now, incidentally, we all know the story, of course, of the Passover and Exodus that occurred the night. Remember, their day starts on the 14th. They, it starts at, that, you know, at the sundown. And that night, the, the angel of death goes through Egypt. You know the story. That night, from sundown to midnight, is the 14th of Nisan to the Jews. What is it to the Egyptians? Friday the 13th. And we're indebted to Emanuel Velikovsky, I think, who first really highlighted the research to demonstrate that that's where the superstition started, that Friday the 13th is unlucky. It's the Gentile side of the Passover. Interesting, isn't it? Now, originally, of course, the Passover was instructed to be killed by the head of the household, but it gets transferred to the temple priests to administer in Deuteronomy 16, first six verses. When you study the Passover in detail, there are dozens of details that are fascinating. One of the prominent ones is they were instructed in Exodus 12 and Numbers 9 and Psalm 34 that not a bone was to be broken. In fact, Psalm 34, 20 is predictive of the Messiah. And you may recall from John 19 when the Roman soldier was instructed to break the legs because they, they normally if crucifixion took a long time. Sometimes it took several days for the guy finally to die. He dies by suffocation because he's in this agony. He's got very difficult vector diagram, if you, pressure on his chest. And he relieved that by pressing up with his legs so he could breathe. Well, if you break his legs, he can't relieve that, and it, it speeds up to death. So because they wanted to get the bodies off the cross before the holiday started, the next day was, was a big day, and there's million, a million visitors to Jerusalem because it's Passover, and they have visit, every able-bodied Jew is commanded to be there. They uh, uh, commanded the soldiers to break the legs, to speed up to death. The soldier comes there and sees he's already dead. He violated his orders. He didn't break the legs. He didn't know it, I'm sure, but he was fulfilling prophecy. Because for Jesus to fulfill the Passover, he had not a bone to be broken. He threw his spear out, and you all know about the blood and water. It came out. 
The rabbis to this day don't understand why they use warm water and mixing the wine at Passover. They have all kinds of rabbinical writings that speculate why they do it. All they have to do is read uh, Matthew 26 to find out. And of course, the entire land was to be consumed. Nothing left the next day is in Exodus 12. Exodus 12 is a fascinating chapter to read. If we had time, we should do it right now probably. Let's keep moving. You remember, Jesus was first introduced by John the Baptist at the beginning of his ministry. When John the Baptist first sees him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Jewish title. He's, he's announcing when he first appears publicly that he's going to be the Passover Lamb. They may not have understood that, but that's what in John chapter 1. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, he calls Jesus our Passover. So Jesus' identity of the Passover is rich and full, and, and your commentary on that is Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, and Psalm 22. We could spend easily several evenings just studying the Passover, but we certainly would be reading those passages if we were had the time. Now, the lamb was presented on the 10th of Nisan, four days in advance, to the priests. On the 10th of Nisan, Jesus was riding that donkey from Bethany up over the Mount of Olives, presenting himself as the Messiah, deliberately fulfilling Zechariah 9.9, riding the donkey, behold thy king cometh, and so forth. He was observed in Matthew 21, there's detail. But the personal representative of the ruler of the world declared him free of blemish. He's presenting his Passover. And Pilate said, I cannot find fault with him. I don't think Pilate realized, but he's fulfilling a rabbinical requirement. He had to be declared free of blemishes. 1 Peter 1. And, by the way, at the end of the yarn, we get to Revelation 5, and we're in heaven, and who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And John says, I turned and I saw the Lamb, not a Lamb, the Lamb, as it had been slain. Revelation 5, 6. Now, there's a lot of other interesting things about the Passover tradition. Uh, in a Jewish home, they have the uh, Berakat uh, Hametz, which is a search for the leaven. The kids are given a project. To, they're supposed to search the house, make sure there's no leaven. And they always hide a little for the kids to find. And they get it, and they, but the whole idea is the house is free of leaven. They go through that routine. And then they have the matzah. You've seen matzah, right? Seen a matzah? You notice that it's pierced and striped? How interesting. I don't think the Jews do that to fulfill the prophecy, but interesting. And by the way, they have three. And they take the middle one, and they crush it. And they wrap it in a cloth and hide it. Hidden. Interesting. And then in the wine, they have four cups. The bringing out, they're labeled. The bringing out, the delivering, the redemption and blessing, and the taking out. And it's interesting. Paul says this cup of blessing that we bless in 1 Corinthians. It seems that Jesus administered the Lord's Supper with a third of the four cups. So some scholars speculate, because then he says he's not going to touch wine until we're together in heaven that that meal is unfinished. And that fourth cup is the one he will share at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's interesting that the fourth cup is the taking out. Interesting. Now, this idea, the, the point is the Mishnah requires that the wine that they administer at Passover be mixed with some warm water, and they don't know why. A lot of rabbis write guesses as to what they think. But the answer, of course, is in John 19.34. When that centurion threw his sword, out came what? Blood and water. And, out, and from that, a, 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 a pathologist can tell you exactly how he died. He died from a broken heart, in effect. It's interesting that uh, the Passover lamb, in one of the passages, is called his body. The whole, the whole program for Passover is called the Haggadah, which means the showing forth. Paul says we show forth his death until he comes. And the application of all this is, of course, to put, apply the blood on the doorposts of our heart. And, of course, circumcision is of the heart. Deuteronomy 10, Jeremiah 4, and, of course, Galatians 3 and Philippians 3, Romans 2, and so on. The next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's important to understand. They use the term, by the way, so let me alert you to something else. There are three feasts that occur with just in a few days. They overlap, sort of. They use the term today, and even in the text some places, when they speak of Passover, they use the term connotatively to refer to all three. It's the season of Passover. If you go to Israel, you're usually there either at the spring, Passover season, if you're trying to hit the holidays, or in the fall, where you pick up the first, you know, the first 15 days, you've got three of them there, the, the Feast of Trumpets and the uh, Yom, Yom Kippur and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. But anyway, the point is, there's Passover, it's certainly critical, and there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which goes for seven days. Let's take a look at it. Verse 6, 
And on the 15th day of the same month, in other words, the Passover is on the 14th, this is on the 15th, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day that ye shall have a holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And on the seventh day is an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. This is the Hag HaMatzah, the, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This, by the way, of these seven feasts, only three of them were compulsory. This is the first of the three that's compulsory. Many Jews will tell you, well, Passover is compulsory. Technically, no, it's the day after. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's the compulsory feast. In Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, three of these feasts are designated to be compulsory. Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Astonishingly, Yom Kippur is not. It's the most solemn of all the feasts, but it's not one of the three that was compulsory, strangely enough. And here we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that leaven is always a type or a model or an idiom of evil, of sin. And it's an interesting idiom for that because leaven does its work, it corrupts by puffing up. Well, that's the root of all sin, is pride, which corrupts us by puffing up. You know, it's interesting how the Holy Spirit indulges in these puns. And they really are pun. We often think of a pun for humor. They're also a pun for communication. And this is one of 200 rhetorical devices that the Holy Spirit uses in the Scripture. It's always a, leaven is always a type of sin. In Exodus 12, 13, Le, uh, Leviticus 2, 6, 10, we've seen it a lot already. In the New Testament also, in Matthew 16, Luke 13, 1 Corinthians 5, Galatians 5, the parable of the woman of the leaven in Matthew 13 hangs on the point that introducing leaven in the three measures of meal was a no-no. Three measures of meal are supposed to be unleavened. The kingdom of heaven, like the woman, put leaven in three measures of meal. You and I miss that because we're Gentiles. A Jew, it's sort of shocked. Gas, you don't do that. That's his point. You need to understand those 13 parables in Matthew 13. They have some, many of them have the real meaning of them. The intended meaning by the rabbi, the master rabbi, uh, is uh, quite in contrast to the way it's often preached from. But I'll let you dig into that. There are other bread models, of course, in the scripture, manna being the best one. Bread from heaven. He fed them until they entered the land. Melchizedek. Interesting. When the strange guy that shows up in Genesis 14. Abraham offers him tithes. And, and the writer in Hebrews makes the point that Levi was in the loins of Abraham. So that meant Melchizedek is higher than Levi. Levi hadn't been born yet, but it's, it's, you have to think like a rabbi. He makes the point that, that uh, Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek and Abraham's descendant was Levi, out of which came the, Aaron the priest. He's making the point that the Melchizedek priesthood is higher and different than the Mosaic priesthood. And indeed, Melchizedek was a king and a priest. In Israel, Judah was the royal line, Levi was the priestly line. They were never to cross. They were to be separate. But that's different in, in three places. In Melchizedek, he's a king and a priest. In Jesus Christ... He's unique. That's what Hebrews writer is dealing with. He's king and a priest. And there's a third person that's a king and a priest. You know who it is? He's sitting in your chair. You are. We are a kingdom of priests. And the rulership and priesthood in Christ, see, as, as members of the body of Christ, that, that, that's the whole point that the writer of Hebrews emphasizes. You can dig into that. This idea of bread model shows up in Joseph. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit... Remember Joseph when he was in Egypt? He went down and he was in prison? For, for how long was it? Twelve years? I forget how, how long it was now. Offhand, I forgot to check my notes. And in prison he encounters two people that have dreams that he interprets that are very profound. One is the baker and one's the wine steward. Right? The baker's dream meant that he's going to get killed. Three days later he was. The wine steward's dream meant that in three days he was going to be freed and he was. He says, remember we when you... Don't forget me now. You know, I gave you the... And he, of course, he does. He forgets all about him. Until some years later, Pharaoh has a dream. Troubling him. And the wine says, oh, yeah, there was that guy in prison that unraveled. But it's interesting. Two things there. One was baker bread and one was wine. There's the, bread and, the elements of bread and wine again. See, it's, it's a little thread. It's almost, it's almost like a, a novelist weaving, like Herman Melville or someone who liked to de deal in symbols, uh, weaving these symbols all through, except it's not fiction, it's real life. And it's... Uh, Cosmic issues here. And of course, the wine steward gets freed. And it's the blood that uh, frees us from bondage and so on. Jesus said, I am the bread of life in John 6. 
Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 also says Jesus was made sin for us. So let's move on to the Feast of First Fruits. This is, an, this is a, a very, very important one that you don't, you don't hear a lot about unless you dig into it and see it. Verse 9, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye have come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest in, unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, if it's the morrow, the morning, after the Sabbath, that means it's a Sunday morning, right? And it's the Sabbath after Passover. So this is the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. It's always on a Sunday. And it's a sheaf. It's not a single, it's a sheaf. I'll come back to that one. There's a very interesting speculation about that. There's a sheaf. Verse 12, And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf uh, an he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two-tenth deals of a fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be with wine and the fourth part of a hin. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears. That until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. A couple of interesting remarks here. This is the first fruit. See, the idea of the first fruit represented the rest of the harvest that was coming. Get the idea? There's something very provocative here. There's no sin offering. If you remember the first six chapters that we studied, we understand there's a burnt offering and a sin offering. They're different. There's no sin offering here. Why? Because he had no sin. Who is being celebrated here? Who's your, what's your first guess? Jesus Christ. Absolutely. It's his resurrection. You see, there was a morning when the women were walking. Over there in the temple, you could see the smoke curling up from the offerings for the Feast of First Fruits. And she was on, they were on their way to a garden and discovering an empty tomb. Because he was the first fruits. He's the fulfillment of this. 1 Corinthians 15, in the re great resurrection chapter, Paul would say it's the most important chapter in the Bible, because without that chapter, we have nothing. But he's our first fruits. In fact, he's described there as first fruits. There's also this strange event that occurs in Matthew 27. You remember on the day, that resurrection day, there were many that many came out of the graves and showed themselves? Nobody knows what that means because there's no other reference to it except that Matthew 27, 52, 53 right there. And some scholars believe that to fulfill the prophecy, there had to be more than one. So Christ was the first, but there were some others, so that he was the first of several. Other scholars say, well, that'll, that'll be the first resurrection continues because it's not an event, it's a category. Don't get confused when first and second resurrection are categories. But um, anyway, the application of this, of course, is Romans eleven sixteen. But we should also probably have echoing in our minds this famous declaration by Job in chapter 19. Fabulous passage, Job 19, 25 and 26, where Job can declare, this, is a, this was before Abraham, this is one of the, old, it's the oldest book of the Bible. Job says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at that latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another though my reins be consumed within me. Job, declaring his conviction to the bodily resurrection that he was destined for. Wild. And of course the application is Galatians 2.20, Romans 6, and so on. But I have to, here we have the Feast of First Fruits. And I love to point this out. It's a little detail, but it's fun. When did Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth begin? We all know that Noah spent 120 years or whatever building this thing in his driveway, getting jeered by his neighbors, right? And one day he entered and then allowed seven days and then God shut the door. Could uh, Noah have gotten out if he wanted to? Hardly. But then we have the flood, 350 some odd days, whatever. We have the flood, right? When the flood ends, the new beginning under Noah starts, right? In verse 4 of Genesis 8, the Holy Spirit says that the ark came to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now, if you're a you know, well-adjusted reader, you just keep reading and don't let stumble over that. But if you've been in one of my Bible studies, you're no longer a normal, well-adjusted student. You remember that Chuck Missler said that everything's there by design. Well, why did the Holy Spirit want you to know that the ark came to rest 
on the 17th day of the seventh month. Well, that's a little tough to unravel because, see, you're in the Genesis calendar. When you get to Exodus 12, you get to Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2, God says, in instituting the Passover, I want you to make this the beginning of months. So there's a different calendar. The civil calendar goes Tishri, Shevon, Shizlu, Tevet, Shavat, Adar, and then Nisan and some others. Nisan is the seventh month on the civil calendar. But God is telling Moses, make, I want you to make that the beginning of months. You follow me? Now, when Jesus was crucified on the 14th. How long was he in the grave, anyone? Three days. So he gets resurrected on the 17th. 14 plus 3 is 17. So Jesus was resurrected on the 17th day of the seventh month. Or putting it another way. The new beginning under Noah began on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Christ. What a coincidence. Huh? Do, you, do, you, do you see God's fingerprints on these things? Now somebody said, well, that's just coincidence. You're making something out of it. I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, it's interesting. I just, it just, thought, just went through my mind. You know, if you're studying fingerprints, just a line or two can make the difference between life and death in certain conditions, can it? You know, if the fingerprint really matches or it doesn't, see? Well, these are, in my mind, are fingerprints. And if you really understand these, you behold the fingerprints of God. It's interesting, by the way, just another observation. In the flight after Passover out of Egypt, Israel, you may recall, retrieved the body of Joseph from his tomb to take with it to the new land, right? After the Passover, Jesus was retrieved from another Joseph's tomb on this very anniversary. Just thought that's kind of fun. Let's go to the next one, which is Shavuot. It's probably the most serious of the bunch. The Feast of Pentecost, as we probably know it. The Feast of Weeks, it's also called. Verse 15 of Leviticus 23. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath. See, there again, we're talking from, in effect, that's saying counting from the Feast of first fruits. Okay? Ye shall count unto you from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So they're to count seven Sabbath days. That's why it's also known in Jew, Hebrew as the Feast of Weeks. Verse 16, Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days. In other words, it's seven Sabbaths plus one. The next day is the one we're talking about. Which again is always a Sunday, isn't it? Okay. Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And that's why it's called the Feast of Pentecost, which is a Greek word for fifty. From a Jewish point of view, you can call it seven weeks, fine. It's also because it's the next day that we're talking about is the Feast of Pentecost, because it's always on a Sunday. Now, there's some other interesting things here. Verse 17. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals, and they shall be of fine flour, and they shall, what? Be bacon with leaven? Notice that. Mark it in your Bible. It's the only place in the Scripture where leavened bread is ordained. Every place else it's unleavened. Here it's leavened. So you want to just notice that. Why leaven? Well, I believe in part it's to give this whole celebration a complexion that's broader than Jewish. Call it Gentile or the nations. And you shall offer the bread uh, with the bread. And by the way, there's two loaves. I have no idea why it's two loaves. All kinds of, all kinds of commentators speculate. There's some interesting speculations. One of the speculations might be Old New Testament, bread of life. Speculation, I, I wouldn't build on that. But they're all, you, can, you can play with that yourself. But let's go on. And ye shall offer the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, one young bullock and two rams, they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord. There's seven lambs, meaning complete, okay? With their meat offering and the drink offerings and the offering uh, made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And then ye shall offer one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs for the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall then wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs, and they shall be holy unto the Lord for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it shall be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute for you forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. This is the second of the feast that is compulsory. Now that puzzles me. If you take the seven feasts of Moses, you'd think, well, the, the ones that are compulsory are the three most important. Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're, you're surprised it's not Passover. Well, Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay, that's a good proxy. Feast of Tabernacles at the end of the climax, fine. 
Why isn't Yom Kippur here? What are the others? No, it's the Feast of Shavuot. That's the Holy Spirit in my way thing of underlying, hey, this is an important one somehow. And this is the one that's more than just Jewish. It's leavened bread. Verse 22, And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor, unto the stranger. I am the Lord your God. That, of course, is an echo of what we call the law of gleaning. If you were a landowner, your reapers could go through your property once and only once. What was left, what was missed, belonged to the widows, the orphans, and destitute. That was their form of welfare. That is detailed for you in Leviticus 19, verse 9. It's also in Deuteronomy 24, the law of gleaning. Now, it fascinates me where that comes up prominently in the Old Testament is the book of Ruth. And the book of Ruth, in fact, is always read at this time, at the Feast of Shavuot. It's also the book in the Old Testament that's prophetic of the church, where she is the, bride, the Gentile bride of the kinsman redeemer and so on. Lots of prophecies in the Old Testament. There's lots of prophecies that Gentiles be saved. That's not what the church is all about. The church is a mystical thing that is laid out for you in Ephesians 3 and following. What's interesting, from an Old Testament, if you're a Christian, from an Old Testament perspective, the one you embrace is Ruth, because it's all about the church, in effect, prophetically. And I challenge you, if you haven't, do a careful study of the book of Ruth. It's, 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 it is probably our most um, demanded Bible study of all the ones we've done in 30 years, is a little study of the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful little book. How interesting it is that it's always read at the Feast of Shavuot. What is the Feast of Shavuot in, in our parlance, typically? Feast of Pentecost. Each of these feasts is prophetic, and it's not only prophetic, they're fulfilled on the day they're observed. The Passover is of the crucifixion. Jesus is crucified on the Passover. The Feast of First Fruits is prophetic of the resurrection, and it is celebrated on Sunday, right? It happens on Sunday. This is the Feast of Pentecost. What happens in Acts chapter 2? What's born in Acts chapter 2? The church. So this of the seven feasts is the most Gentile of them all. There are all kinds of books written by prophecy buffs who think that the Feast of Trumpets or the Feast of Tabernacles is the rapture. I don't think so. Doesn't mean I'm right, I just don't think so. If there's a feast that links to the rapture, I'm not saying this does, but if there is one, this would be my bet. I'll, oh, I'll show you another reason why in a minute. Uh, this is called Hag HaShavot, or Hag HaKazir, the Feast of Harvest, the first harvest actually. And it's observed with the two loaves of leavened bread. It's not offered on the altar, interestingly enough. Two lambs are offered, Jew, Gentile, law versus grace, take your pick. Um, it's interesting that in Acts chapter 2, as it gets to the whole Feast of Pentecost thing, in the verse, first verse of Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Strange phrase. Does that mean all the other observances were anticipatory of what happened that day? And what happened that day? As you know, the church was born. Something else you might want to do as you study, and this maybe is in your advanced section. Um, in fact, I'll so annotate that as a... One of the things you might do is read these two chapters side by side. Read, obviously, Acts 2, but also read Exodus 19. And there are lots of little subtleties that I think will leap out at you. Exodus 19 is the birth of Israel. Acts chapter 2 is the birth of the church. Exodus 19 is the giving of the Torah. And uh, on the third day of the third month is 46 days, and Moses was told to prepare for the third day. That's 49 days. How interesting. The term trumpet of God is only used twice in the Bible. There are lots of trumpets, and we're going to talk about that shortly. But there's the trumpet of God is a phrase that occurs only twice in the Scripture. It's in Exodus 19 at the giving of the law of Sinai, and it is, guess where? At the rapture of the church, 2 Thessalonians 4. Excuse me, first, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4. It's in Exodus 19, verses 13 and 16, and it's in a rapture, it also echoes in the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. So you might make something of that, maybe not. I just mentioned it in passing. But there's a tradition. I don't like traditions. I'm curious about some of them. Uh, I think any tradition that isn't supported by Scripture is suspect. Most of the ones that are not supported by Scripture are not, only not correct, they're wrong. I mean, they're provably wrong. But there is a Jewish tradition that I'm trying to track down. I, I, know that, I know it's around in some of the writings. I can't figure out why they believe this peculiar tradition. And that has to do with Enoch. 
you all know that Enoch didn't die. He was raptured, if you will. They have a tradition that he was born on the day that is later celebrated as the Feast of Shavuot. Where they get that, I don't know, probably from Gematria or something. But the interesting thing that caught my eye is they also believe he was raptured on his birthday. And when I heard that, I thought, what? Where do they get that? Well, because there are three groups of people that face the judgment of God of the flood in Noah. Those that perished in the flood, those that were miraculously preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood. You say, well, it was just one guy. So is the body of Christ, one. Interesting idea. See, one thing you want to realize, in any case, your, your insights here will be heavily dependent on you recognizing that Israel and the church are distinct. In the 70 weeks of uh, Daniel, which you've studied a lot, obviously there's a, verse 26 has a gap between the two. The church is hidden in the Old Testament. Paul tells us that in Ephesians 3. In fact, in, when, when Jesus declares his mandate for his ministry in Luke 4, he reads from Isaiah 61, and he deliberately stops at a comma, closes the book, and says, this day is this fulfilled in the area. He does not read. There's an omission. That comma has lasted 2,000 years. The omission he didn't get to is the day of vengeance of our God that's yet future. That, com that comma is the same gap, the same interval that Gabriel had in prophecy gave Daniel, Daniel 9. And uh, John, even in, in Revelation chapter 12, summary of Israel, between verse 5 and verse 6, when the, when the, when the body is caught up, there's a, an interesting gap. We always think the man-child being caught up to God in his throne is the ascension. No, I think it was G. H. Pember that first recognized that possibly is allusion to the body of Christ, the rapture. Or maybe they're both in view. Why not? We know that Israel is temporarily set aside. Jesus declared it in Luke 19, verse 42. And Paul tells us not forever. He says they're, set aside, they're blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Interesting. So if the rapture should occur on Shavuot, is it possible that the same holiday that stopped Israel's clock will restart it? Who knows? It's an interesting idea. There are certain friends of mine that always get kind of excited each year as the Feast of Shavuot comes up. And it's coming up next month, I believe. I forgot to check the calendar exactly. But that's kind of fun. Maybe it's already here. No, I don't think so. It's, it's 50 days after Easter. You can figure it out. The real Easter. Yeah, okay. Okay. The next one is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Notice something here, by the way. The first of the month is on the calendar. It may not be on Sabbath, Saturday. You follow me? But it is a Sabbath. One of the things you need to be sensitive to is there are not just 52 Shabbats in a year, in a Jewish year. There are seven extra ones, high Sabbaths or holy convocations. They're treated as a Sabbath, even though they're not on Shabbat, necessarily. Yeah, not on Saturday, necessarily. The first of the month you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Now, by the way, um, this, this Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, not to be confused with Rosh Hashanah, as I mentioned before, which means the chief of the year, it's the Jewish New Year. That's in the civil sense. The Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, is the religious year. By the way, it's the beginning of the sabbatical month. It's the seventh month of the religious year. Uh, there's a, a, a cycle of seven uh, days, weeks, also seven months, and this is the seventh month. Verse 25, Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall make an, offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, this originally in the script, you'll notice, is a one-day celebration, except in about 500 B.C., they added, the rabbis added a second day. So in the Jewish world, it's a two-day celebration. But that's not, that's, they've added that. They speak of the tekeah shofar. This is the ram's horn. This is not the silver uh, trumpets of the temple. You find trumpets all through the scripture. This is not the tr silver trumpets. Uh, this is the shofar. This is the ram's horn. Now, I meant to bring one. I brought a couple back from Israel for gifts. I should have brought one tonight, but that's okay. Now, you remember the big event in Genesis 22 was the offering of Isaac, and they had a substitutionary ram. Ram, okay? That's where the ram is instituted. That substitution is called the akidah. The, the, the left horn of the ram was considered the first trump, and the right horn is called the last trump in Jewish parlance. They have three series of ten blasts each, and then a final blowing of ten blasts. The Tekiah Gedalah. 
which is the great blowing. They're not short blasts for alarm, it's the long blast of victory that they have. Now, there's a lot of discussion comes up about the so-called last trump, which shows up in 1 Corinthians 15. We also have uh, in Matthew 24, verse 31, the angels, there be a trumpet blown and the angels gather the elect from the four winds and so forth. Don't confuse the trumpet here of collecting God's elect with the seventh trumpet judgment of Revelation. They have nothing to do with one another. The seventh trumpet is not the last trump anyway, because trumpets are blown all through the millennium. So the trumpets in Revelation, the trumpets of the rapture, aren't the last trumpets ever blown. That's not the point. It's the last trump in another idiomatic sense. I'm sort of reminded, you know, at the Naval Academy classes, you typically had a bell when the class was supposed to start. You had a class, you had a bell four minutes later, and then you had a bell five minutes later, as I recall. The, the one bell announced that the class starts. If you got there before the next bell, the four-minute bell, you weren't late. If you got there after the four-minute bell, you were late. If you got there after the five-minute bell, you were absent, even though you were there. So what you want to do is get there before the last bell. You understand? The last of the series is the point. And it's my personal suspicion that's the idiom that Paul is using there. The last trump is the last one we want to hear. We're on our way. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different thing. So, so don't try to connect the last trump of Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians with the last trump of... Uh, there's a lot of books on prophecy that go, go, go all haywire because they try to make the, the seventh trumpet judgment somehow tie to that. And, and all kinds of things fall apart. It doesn't work. Okay. Now there's something else that occurs. It's not in your text, but it's well observed. Between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur... There are seven, there are ten days, but there are seven days before Yom Kippur called the Yomim Norim, which is uh, the days of affliction. They're in effect the sort of days of preparation for Yom Kippur. They're suggestive of the thrashing floor, and you could go to Luke 3 and get a feeling for that. And some people regard the idiom of the thrashing floor idiomatically of the tribulation, by the way. You notice that in Ruth, uh, book of Ruth, Ruth is at Boaz's feet in the thrashing floor scene. After you, if you've studied Ruth, that's a very important discovery, realize, uh, insight to realize. But let's move on. Verse 26. We're now getting to the, the, the solemn one of the year, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. People who know of none other all know about Yom Kippur. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Yom Kippur, tenth of Tishri. And uh, it's discussed in detail in Leviticus 16, of course here, and also in Hebrews 9, the first 16 verses. And that's your best commentary on it, frankly. It's the most solemn of all the feasts, and we covered this pretty much back when we looked at Leviticus chapter 16. But he goes on here in verse 28, You shall do no work in the selfsame day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy among his people. Well, that's interesting. See, you don't want to add, you don't want to work. You don't want to add to what God has completed. Interesting. Verse 31. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. And even unto evening. Ye shall celebrate your Sabbath. Again, it's the Sabbath, even though it's the 10th. It's not necessarily a Saturday. Now, this is the day, of course, the high priest can enter the Holy of Holies. It's the only day of the year, and he can only do that after great ceremonial preparation, and he sprinkles the mercy seat. And God, who dwells between the cherim, above the cherim, looking down at the broken law, is propitiated because of the shed blood, of course. And that's also where we have the two goats, the Azazel, the scapegoat, and the other one. One's offered, one is turned loose in the wilderness. Leviticus 16 dealt with all of that, you recall, and of course it's exemplified in Matthew 27, 2 Corinthians 5, and of course in Isaiah 53, and, and so on. In fact, 52, 15. In fact, if you visit Jerusalem and visit the Temple Institute, you will see the lottery box that they intend to use when they pick which boat goat's going to be offered and which one goes is led into the wilderness, the scapegoat. And uh, so it's actually, you can actually see it there and handle it. This also has to do with the red heifer. It gets covered in Numbers 19 and Hebrews 9, 13. And uh, you won't understand John 2 and the water turned to wine unless you understand which water was used. That was the water of purification. Then we have this, this is the day that the veil 
was torn in two from top to bottom. That veil, according to the Josephus, was four inches thick. This wasn't a, we used the term veil, we visualized something sort of gossamer. No, this was a, this was a tapestry, a, you know, heavy tapestry kind of thing. It was torn from top to bottom. And of course, the Hebrews 10 makes a big issue of all of that. I should mention something here as we talk about this. There is very little relationship between what we're seeing here, which is Mosaic Judaism and Talmudic or Rabbinic Judaism. The Judaism today, which you would properly call Talmudic Judaism or Rabbinic Judaism, has very little connection to the Bible, to the, to, to the Torah. They'd be offended by that, but frankly, see, the problem they have, they've lost the temple for 1900 years. And that leaves them in a dilemma. Because the Torah, Leviticus 17.11, says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Well, where can they shed blood? There's no altar. There's no temple. they got a problem. They can't cling to the old ways because the old ways are not available to them. So they have redefined and, and rationalized a man-centered, good work system of appeasement, prayer and charity and penance and so forth. But that's the Talmudic Judaism. The Mosaic Ju Judaism is at an end because the fulfillment of that was Jesus Christ. So they're in a bind. They either accept Jesus the Messiah, and that makes that's called what we call, a, we use the term Messianic Jew, or completed Jew, as some people like to say, in the sense that he's found as Messiah. Or you embrace Talmudic Judaism, which is a rationalization that's distant from the original text. It leans heavily on the impressions and interpretations of generations of brilliant uh, but misguided rabbis. Anyway, let's move on to Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Lord, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Now this is what we call Sukkot. The word means booths. It's the fifteenth of Tishri. It's, the, it's five days, maybe it's exemplifying. Five generally means, suggests grace. So it's five days after Yom Kippur. Verse 35, on the first day shall be a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. And this, by the way, is the third of the three compulsive feasts. Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Shavuot, or Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 36, seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, a meat offering, a sacrifice, and drink offerings, everything upon his day. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your freewill offerings, which ye give unto the Lord. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. The eighth day, by the way, has a special name, Shemini Etzaret, the day of assembly, they call it, the eighth day of assembly. Verse 40, And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees, the boughs of thick trees, the willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord of your God seven days. By the way, they build, what they do is really quite colorful. In anticipation of this Feast of Tabernacles, all the Jews build a temporary dwelling in their backyard or wherever they can do it. It's sort of like a camping, a camp out thing. But they have to build it so you can see the stars through the roof and that the wind can blow through the walls. You can't make it solid. You've got to make it very temporary, like, and that's deliberate. Because the intention is it's to remind them of the wilderness wanderings when they were the, under the open sky and where the wind, you know, see, it, it, that's, it, that's the intention. Those are to, that, that's their temporary dwellings. And the big climax at the end of this is when they leave, get this, leave their temporary dwellings to return to their permanent dwellings. You get a feeling what that might say? That's why so many people say, well, gee, that sounds like the rapture. So there are a lot of Bible scholars that feel if, if one of the feasts is predictive of the rapture, it would be this one. I don't happen to think so, but that doesn't mean I'm right. Now, they also had some, they have a procession here with four different kinds of, of uh, leaves. They have the lulav willow, they have the myrtle, the palm, and the ethrog, the citrus. One has no fragrance and no fruit, one has fragrance and no fruit, one has fruit and no fragrance, and one has fragrance and fruit. I don't know what you make of that. It sort of sounds like the four soils, maybe, from Matthew 13, but not quite, so let's leave that go. Trees are men in, in a number of places, Psalm 1 and Daniel 4 and so on. We could, we could do more of that. But, and they sacrificed 13 bulls, 2 rams, 14 lambs, and 1 kid. Uh, and it goes from it goes, uh, uh, 13, 12, 11, down for 7 days. When you go through that arithmetic, there's 70 sacrifices. 70 sacrifices. 
and that's that the Talmud ties that to Genesis 10, the 70 nations of the world. By the way, some people feel that the transfiguration in Matthew 17 was near the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why Peter, in his zeal, there says, we can make three booths. Why is he thinking booths? Is it because it's at the time or about the time of... That's just speculation, not important. Verse 41. And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute for you ever in your generation. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Let your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So they have temporary dwellings for seven days, then there's a special Sabbath at the end of that. And remember I said a feast is a rehearsal, right? And so on. Verse 44, And Moses declared unto the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. You know, Hebrews 11 declares that all these, all these Israelites ever since, have died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. How? If nothing else, in their, in their calendar. And were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They were persuaded of them, and they embraced them. Now, by the way, this particular season is going to be celebrated in the millennium. Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 18 says, It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year. You notice that? All the nations that are left of all the nations that came up. You see, this is after Armageddon all that. Shall even go up from year to year to worship the King of the Lord of hosts and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto the Jerusalem to worship the King... The Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. That must mean they need rain in the millennium. Get that. Eh? And if the family of Egypt not go up and come not and have no rain, they shall, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Sounds like you better do it. I, I, I have one other thing that I'd like to share with you that's to me a mind blower. Okay? There's been a lot of controversy about the so-called Bible codes. And the main, and when they say that, they really mean a specific code, the equidistant letter sequence. There's actually dozens of different codes that are clearly there, but the equidistant letter sequence thing as a form of encryption, uh, most people who write about this don't have a crypto background, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the, the, there seems to be certain things hidden in the biblical text. An example of this happens to be in Genesis 1, verse 14. Genesis 1, verse 14 reads as follows, And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Why are there lights in the heavens? Among other reasons, to demark the seasons. The word for seasons is hamoyedim. That's what's translated seasons. It means actually what it means is the appointed times. When you take a computer and you search for this sequence in, through the Torah, the word appears only once in encrypted form at a sequence, at an interval, an uh, equidistant letter sequence of 70 letters. If you take every 70th letter centered on that verse, for, for, well, first of all, if you take every 70th letter, it turns out it spells Hamoyedim. And where does that occur? It's not just happens a statistical accident for two reasons I'll show you. One reason, it's centered on this very verse. Where it's introduced in the text. You see the connection between the hidden code and, and, and the link. That, that's, that's a key thing. What's so interesting about the number 70, there are 70 specially appointed times in the holy days called the homoyanim in a year, as defined by Leviticus 23. There are 52 Sabbaths, seven days of Peshach, that's encompassing a Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of Firstfruits. One day for Hag Ha Shavuot, the Feast of uh, Pentecost. One day for Yom Teror, the Feast of Trumpets. Remember, it's one day in the scripture, they celebrate two days. And one day for Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Seven days for Shukot, the Feast of Booths, and one day, which is the eighth one of that, the Shimini Atzeret. That's 52 plus 7 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 7 plus 1, which adds up to 70. The very interval that that word is encrypted in the Torah. Now, what makes the, you think this is a coincidence? I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Another reason. See, the longer the word is, the more rare it is, or more unlikely it is, for it to show up just statistically. Just the fact that it does in itself isn't significant. It needs to cluster. There has to be some other rationale or, or it's a, sus a suspect. If you do a statistical analysis of the Hebrew alphabet and the 78,000 letters of the book of Genesis, statistically you would expect this to show up by random chance five times. What's interesting, it only shows up once and it shows up exactly on the verse that happens to talk about it. 
And the chance has been, uh, uh, the experts have estimated that the possibility of that happening by accident is one chance in 70 million. 70 million in one. God is great, isn't he? Isn't he fun? Um, well, we've run out of our time. Our notes will have some study questions, some research projects, and some discussion questions and so on. Let's close with a word of prayer. Well, Father, we thank you that you are in control of the appointed times. And we thank you, Father, that you have an appointment for us. And, oh, Father, we would ask that through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you prepare us to acquit ourselves honorably as good stewards of the days that remain. We do pray, Father, that we indeed might number our days, that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. We thank you, Father, for your word. But above all, Father, we thank you for your word, which became flesh and dwelt among us. And we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We thank you, Father, that he tabernacled among us. Oh, Father, we would ask you to help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of him that we might be more fruitful and more pleasing in thy sight. As we commit ourselves into your hands, indeed in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.